This is a very new podcast, but we're starting strong with some top, top guests, especially today. Because unless you've been living in a cave for the last several years, you know our guest as the mighty Sargon of Akkad, one of the top YouTubers in the game, especially in the politics culture war sphere. He then had a foray into real life politics, where he was immediately attacked by the mainstream media, who he duly called dirty, dirty smear merchants, thus coining an iconic phrase. Then about two, two years ago, he launched LotusEaters.com which is a podcast, but also an entire educational platform where he and his team of very smart people do video and written content on politics, philosophy, history, literature, etc. And there's really nothing else like it, and I highly recommend it. You can sign up for just £5 a month, and you'll learn more than you will at most universities these days. So let's welcome our guest. You may know him as Sargon, as I've said, but these days, more likely, just simply Carl Benjamin. And Carl, did I leave anything out of my intro there? No, I think you, uh, think you pretty much covered it all, actually. I'm trying to big you up. Why did you actually yeah. start Lotus Eaters? Because I've done Lotus Eaters, people will know occasionally. Why did you start Lotus Eaters? I never asked you. Honestly, because of the dramatic dearth of conservative intellectual content. Uh, you can name probably a dozen left-wing intellectuals just off the top of your head if you wanted to. Uh, you could just start reading them off. But you mm. probably couldn't name a dozen conservative intellectuals. And that's a real problem. And one of the reasons that conservatives are continually losing the culture war, they are very bad at actually mimetically transmitting their own ideas and their own perspective. Uh, and it's so bad that, in fact, the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom doesn't know what being conservative is. And they've gone through a crisis of conscience and decided, ah, oh, it means being a Blairite. And so now we have Blairism forever. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. They don't ever explain what conservatism is. And you've said that before about the philosophers. You said it somewhere the other day, and I tried to count in my head, and I went, oh, he's, that's not true. Uh, Edmund Burke, uh, Roger Scruton. All right, Go that's on. it. Go <laughs> on. I'm out, I'm out. Exactly. And that's the thing of left-wing ones. I was just reading them off. Like you said, I was like, yeah. Foucault, Deleuze, and Derrida, yeah. and all these people. It's ridiculous. It's exactly yeah. as you said. Yeah, well, they're so bad at explaining it. So, yeah, okay, so that's why you started Lotus Eaters, but you sort of wanted to delegate, and because there's only one Carl until we invent mm. cloning, so you wanted to, like, you know, have more reach that way. Well, it's not just that. It's, uh, I'm only one man. There's only so much I can do. Um, but if we are able to give gainful employment to lots of different people, then we get lots of very good, intelligent perspectives, and it becomes something of a kind of private think tank to advance uh, conservative ideas, which I think, I mean, is desperately needed. Yeah. Like, I, I the, the, the good thing about what we do is that we are, there are no strings on us, right? We are funded entirely by our audience. So there is no one to whom we are beholden other than the platforms we use to communicate our message. And even then, all we need to do is just not put out certain opinions about certain topics on those platforms but on our own platform we can have whatever opinion we like and until the powers that be decide that that even that is verboten um we can have whatever opinions we like about anything and so we're not trapped in the blairite paradigm which modern conservatives still are and even those conservatives who know that that's the problem seem to be in this position because of their interaction with the mainstream. And so we have developed a space where we can have the thoughts that we think are right without having to genuflect towards the previous paradigm. Yeah, that reminds me of two things. One is that Steve Baker, conservative politician, p posted in the really woke tweet the other day. Politician. Yeah, yeah, about being an LGBT ally. And he's a nice guy and he's a Christian, but I, I had to raise it in an article for the Despise Daily Skeptic. I Steve Baker. <laughs> He is, he is a Steve. leftist. He is an open leftist in the Conservative Party. I mean, like Liz Truss at least pretends to be a conservative. Yeah, well, <laughs> even I'm, though I'm, she was a Liberal Democrat. But I'm, how would Steve Baker be uncomfortable in the Liberal Democrats? How would he be uncomfortable in the Labour Party at this point? Because Ke Keir Starmer's starting to give it all a bit. Well, actually, maybe we don't need so much immigration. Maybe we need to lower taxes a little bit. And it's like, what? Oh, great! Now we get the. The, the revolution from the right from Keir Starmer because the Conservative Party is such a progressive party. It's insufferable. I hate British politics. Well, yeah, no argument there. I mean, I, I try and be nice because I've met Steve, but yeah, no argument about the party. And the other thing you remind me of is the recent Crowder Daily Wire thing. So Lotus Eaters, you're not going to have any of that. No one's going to be saying, oh, I'm not free because like you say, it's completely funded <laughs> by the audience. Well, so no one will be complaining about a $50 million contract. No, de we're not that big yet. Uh, <laughs> that's no, that's no. the difference between England and America, isn't it? We're, we're all just 50, we're 50 million. We're like, yes, 
But in England, we wouldn't have anything like that ever. No, I mean, no, it's no, in no. Swindon. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're based in Swindon. We're not one of the fifty million dollars. But the thing is, I, I based this in Swindon for a reason. Is in we're outside of London. I didn't want to be in London. I didn't want to be trapped in the London paradigm, because that's um, that's like our sort of you know California or you know Washington DC. And I want to avoid that. I want to I want to have an authentic voice um, speaking as an Englishman in England rather than a politically captured entity in the capital city. Uh, I don't want to feel that a bunch of my dependencies and relationships are contingent on not speaking authentically what I think about the, the world. Yeah, and uh, the only thing is you'd get more guests more easily if it was in London. I'd be able to do it more, but you've made that sacrifice, Carl. Yes. I, and I understand why. I mean, and, and you mentioned being an Englishman there, and that's what I wanted to ask you about. So you got banned from Twitter for like five years yeah. And in fact, I told you like a few weeks ago, you're back on. You're like, I don't think I have. I was like, you totally are. And I was so because of that, I started researching your Twitter. And I was like, I think yeah. he is back on it. So I became like a sleuth looking at your old Twitter. And on your old Twitter bio, you had anti-identitarian liberal YouTuber, which I thought was quite interesting. That's a sort of fairly typical anti-ID politics like Andrew Doyle or Toby Young, many of my friends, and you're a liberal. Fair enough. But then in the five years of exile... You come back and you put the word Englishman, and that's the only word you went with. And I thought, like, why is Carl? Now I've got my own ideas on why you've done that, but why? Why was that? The world has changed, and we must change with it. Um, I am still opposed to the idea of identity politics, but my particular concern about identity politics is not very well supported in the current political paradigm. The current political paradigm is defined by identity and the problem one of the major problems that the conservatives have in fact is their lack of self-identification and the problem with not identifying yourself aggressively is that the people you are talking to are more than happy to do it for you which is why they will call you a turf a nazi a misogynist a this a that the other these are all identifying signatures identities that they wish you to own and in fact, no, I will actually begin from the positive perspective of defining myself and then whatever follows from that follows. And so fundamentally, the identity I hold is that of an Englishman. I am an Englishman. I live in England. I live in the Shires. This is what I am. And in, in my heart, this is what I think of myself as. Uh, and so that's the basic position I come to. And the important thing about this, and I think this is the, the reason that Englishman is an important identity to the English and to me, is that it situates me in a time and a place. Because the problem is, you could say, well, I'm black. It's like, okay, so is Shaka Zulu. Do you live 300 years ago? No. Right? That you, are, you have nothing in common with Shaka Zulu. You live in London and you sat there going, I'm black. It's like, so what? So what? What does that mean? That's not a, that's not a people. That's not from a place. That doesn't come with it. Uh, kind of an ethic. There's nothing... There's no tradition there. You could have been born yesterday and you'd be black. You could have been born in a thousand years and you'll be black. This, this situates you outside of time and space. This is an abstract category. And there's very little moral or um, cultural baggage that is attached to an abstract category. Whereas, actually, if I situate myself within a time and a place, I'm locating myself on a continuum. As in, I consider myself to be the inheritor of a set of traditions and a cultural legacy that goes back over a thousand years. And I would like it to go long into the future as well. And so I understand myself actually now in what is genuinely real as well. Because saying, well, look, no, I'm, I'm appealing to this abstract categorical. It's like, okay, but <laughs> in what way are you an abstract categorical? Hmm. You are a real solid person. You exist here and now. You know, don't give me this bollocks about being oh, I'm the LGBT community. What a community that is entirely abstract? There's no such thing. However, I can point myself to the place I live and the people who live around me and say, no, this is actually a community. Uh, and so it is essentially making it more real, you know, and it, suddenly you become aware that actually, no, I am a real person. I have inherited a cultural legacy. I probably should nurture and curate this cultural legacy in order to pass it on to my own children so they can do the same for their own children like my father and grandfather and people before me did for me because there's the genuine value in these cultural legacies they help situate you in the universe they help you understand 
who you are and why you are the person that you are why you have ended up where you are and what's good about it and what's worth defending about it frankly yeah, so it's a switch from the kind of universalist idea of liberalism and the rationalist idea of the, what you call the, the self-made man, sometimes I've heard you call, as if yeah. they're just plucked from nowhere. Yeah. And it's instead a sort of Scrutonian primacy of place, I say, yeah. having read two chapters of Scruton. And uh, it's a kind of... No, you are to- right. Yeah, he talks about the oikos, meaning sort of the family yeah. and the community around it, building out from the family unit to the nation. Religion mm. is in there as well, but, it's also, but it has to be tied to place. And he critiques Islam. There's this kind of floating religion this ideology that tries to take over the world, whereas he talks about Christianity, but as part of the nation, that's a Christian nation, but it's tied mm. to place. So it's a sort of shift towards a more sort of small C conservative approach from being a liberal. And sometimes you are called a conservative now and you seem less averse to it than you used to be. I mean, I wouldn't even call myself conservative because the problem with the term conservative is it's completely devoid of any kind of normative uh, teleology. There's just nowhere it's trying to go. It's just trying not to go where the left are going as fast as the left are going and this stems right back from the very inception of the term i mean the whole point was essentially to concede that the left was right about how civilization should be constructed they just wanted it done at a moderate pace and i'm sorry i've come to the conclusion that no actually the left is not right about how civilization should be constructed in fact it's entirely wrong about how civilization should be constructed, which is why every left-wing attempt to construct a civilization ends in bloodshed and tyranny. There is just simply no excuse for removing the person from the idea, because ideas do not exist separate to people's heads. They are intrinsic part of people. They are not something that floats in the magical ether above us, ready for us to pluck one and go, oh my god, look at this thing I found outside of time and space. No, all ideas come from a time and a place. And so, okay, let's tie everything back to reality for once. You know, reality is where things actually happen. And so what I think is more useful, more fruitful, and what, in fact, even to this day, shows that it is more useful than whatever radical proposition the left has, is the iterative knowledge that is built up in traditions traditions are not simply arbitrary they are not unchanging what they are is a cumulative web of experiences that a civilization builds up and through this collective experience we learn what is good and what is bad and the good begins to aggregate and so with a tradition you have the collective wisdom of a thousand years behind you or you have the latest left-wing french philosopher who's like hey guys i think maybe prisons are a bad idea maybe we should let out all the prisoners because really it's society that's evil and it's like no you're just fucking wrong yeah, you're yeah. just wrong and you don't know what you're talking about of course france is a place but it's it's a bad place but uh, <laughs> a, you know he said french philosopher yeah that's mm. interesting i mean i when i looked into conservatism more for example i know you're saying you're not necessarily conservative and it, it I is call disturbing. A traditionalist. The, a traditionalist. Okay. Yeah, we'll get on to that. It is disturbingly nebulous. Like, you know, Edmund Burke basically said, I'm not sure about this French Revolution thing. And then Scruton's written a whole book, How to Be a Conservative. He struggles to define it. I'm like, he was the foremost uh, conservative philosopher alive at that time. And I'm like, he doesn't totally know what it is. It's yeah. based on this inductive reasoning, like what seems to work and what we seem to like rather than any, you know, universal, rational, imposed, top down strictures. Mm. But um, the other thing I want to do is... What's God. worse is it's doomed. It's just doomed to lose ground because it's yep. got no generative principles of its own. And all it can do is look at what has come before and say, we'll just keep it. We won't bother mm. changing it. Right. Then it's just the slow, gradual decline that is inevitable. It can't ever seem to build anything from within right. itself. And it's like, okay, well, what can? And actually, a set of moral values that we have inherited from the past that, sh- that say you know, things should be a certain way actually does allow us to begin pushing back and say, no, that's bad, we should get rid of that. Or this is good, we should have more of this. I mean, look at architecture as a great example. We should have more beautiful buildings. I mean, this is a point that Scruton made over and over. Is yeah. There's no reason that we shouldn't treat our own civilization like a work of art. And in fact, in previous, in, in previous eras, we did. We had a beautiful country with very well-bred people, people who were respectable. Even, I mean, go back and watch video footage from 60 years ago you know 50 years ago the people 
involved in the discussions are just a higher quality of person. They are better cultivated. The the place they're in looks lovely. If you if you see footage of the streets, the buildings are beautiful. You don't see any brutalism. Or this is the sort of early era of brutalism, I suppose. Fifty years. They're all now. thin and they've all got bowler hats. Uh, but they're all refined in some yeah. way that we have definitely lost in modernity. And I just see you see people walking around now with just their heads down. They're just like sullen looking. It's like these are not a people proud of who they are or where they live. And we could be, we used to be, and there's no reason we shouldn't be. We should be able to feel good about the civilization in which we live, but no one does anymore. And I'm not surprised. Look at the state of it. It's an asshole, you know? Absolutely. And, and yeah, like you say, there was no reason for it. And, and Scruton talks about that in his brilliant documentary, Why Beauty Matters. You can have beauty, and there's no reason not to. I know that's another thing you're trying to do with Lotus is to think about aesthetics and things and what could our art be, what can our literature be, not just arguing about politics on Twitter, though we have yeah. to do that as well. The only other thing I wanted to pick up on your Englishman point, I'll get on to the more onto traditionalism because mm. I've got loads of questions about it, but the you didn't say British, which I noticed, which interests me for a couple of reasons. Yes. One, because I was raised English, you know, we just thought we were English and we're a very similar age, so you That's may be you the are same. English. Huh? <laughs> That's because you are English. Exactly, but then in, around, I think it was probably around the Blair years, somewhere in the 90s, suddenly we were British. And, in a, and it was, I was like, what's this about? Now, in a way, perhaps English was a falling away because you've, you've obviously had an exchange with Peter Hitchens recently. He's someone who would probably think of himself as British and it, it, harking back to the era, perhaps, so, you know, Britannia rules the waves, whereas we just grew up as English. But then we were told in this kind of kitsch way we were British and we're like, am I? Because no Scottish person is calling himself British and, le- and no Welsh person increasingly, I'm not even going to touch Ireland, but, you know, we'd just be English. And, and so you specifically said English and not British. The problem with the term British is it doesn't refer to a people. Uh, it refers to a state. In fact, it, rep- it refers to an empire. Uh, it was the union of the crowns after Scotland had bankrupted themselves trying to set up the Scottish colonial empire, which uh, facilitated the merger of Scotland and England into the state of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and then later on Ireland. And so Britain was consciously an imperial project from the start Uh, the scots wanted to get access to english colonial holdings in order to gain access to these markets Um, and so this became a very ephemeral identity it's a very top layer identity and it's some it's an identity that is actually pretty incorporative it is open to almost anyone you know, there are lots of British Indians, British Africans, British, you know, Americans, but there are British people all over the world because really it's a kind of constructed civic identity. It is not a sort of a, a deep and ethnic identity. It's not something that is connected to a particular people in a particular time, in a particular place. Almost anyone around the world can call themselves British at this point. And it's not bad that that exists. It's actually a very good thing because it also speaks to a particular way of doing things in many ways, the English way of doing things, which is why I think the term British and English kind of harmonised and then the, the more politically correct British was taken instead of English. But you'll notice now that you're just it's, it's just not a noticeable thing to ever speak of England. And England is a place with a people who are frankly being taken advantage of, in my opinion. Like the, the mass migration is not going to Scotland or Wales nearly as proportionally as it is going to England. And the English, at least at least in Scotland and Wales, they have parties that will call themselves, well, the, we're the Scottish Nationalist Party, we're played Cymru. They at least mention their, their cultural and national names in the party. They can accept that the, the Welsh are a people and the Scottish are a people, and they get to have a right to have a voice. But the English don't have any such thing. And then people say, well, what about devolved parliament for England? It's like, well... The English Parliament is Westminster, so we're kind of stuck with England being occupied by the British Empire at the moment. Uh, I'm not really an imperialist. I'm a little Englander. I don't think that we need a colonial empire, and I uh, I really think that England or uh, well, Britain, the the empire is over, and we need to start thinking in terms of that because mm. you'll you'll notice that the the British Empire never lost, right? It, it didn't lose. But it did fail. And so after the defeat of Nazi Germany, uh, the the British Empire was essentially wound down, and you see the shrinkage of the empire, back to what is essentially just the occupation of these islands. 
but the institutions persisted and you still see the legacy colonial attitude in our politicians today when someone like rishi sunak or liz truss or boris johnson say i believe britain's best days are ahead of us oh really oh really we controlled a fifth of the globe so how how much of the globe are you expecting to control and and in what time scale liz a quarter of the globe in the next what 20 years like what is your plan to reconquer the empire there is no reconquering the empire it's over right and that's okay it it was dominant for a century did a lot of good things in that time did some bad things but okay who didn't and now we can just essentially lay it to rest and say right britain was a great project but that time has passed and so now we need to consider ourselves and then the question is well what is ourselves what what are we we are the English, they are the Scottish, they are the Welsh, they are the Northern Irish, and we have relations with other peoples. We can, it, we deserve to be able to have a voice in the dialogue of England. Because mm. at the moment, it's all minoritarian. It's just minority interests. Non-stop. It's LGBT, it's black, it's Muslim, it's Asian, it's whatever. And I'm just like, oh my god. You know, can we not talk about the regular families of this country who are currently struggling under a massive tax burden, under an inflation crisis, under mass immigration, under the housing problems, like the buying houses? Like, can we not talk about their problems? Are they not the people for whom this country is run? Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. the reason this is all bothering me. And the only time you hear about England is uh, during the football and Trump said, and they're playing as England. I can't do an impression, but he said, uh, they're playing as England. Interesting, you don't hear that word much. And they're all kneeling now anyway before the matches. But you're right, we never hear about England. We've been colonised by Britain. I'll, I'll, I get the point. And the yeah. point about empire, this, is, this will bring us on to the next thing. that You put in your bio Englishman when you came back on Twitter. Then you added postmodern traditionalist, which is a phrase probably people haven't heard much. And this is kind of, this is very interesting because a lot of people, my friends included, seem to be attacking along the same grounds of liberalism, free speech. We had free speech, we had liberals, we had civil liberties, all this stuff. You guys all messed it up with wokeness. Let's just go back to this. Whereas what you seem to have done in my kind of person who doesn't read uh, layman analysis is you've sort of said, all right, like, we've lost this battle, lads. Let's run down this other hill and win this battle, which is you've accepted their terms of yeah. cultural relativism You've accepted their terms of radical subjectivity and you've said we are just another culture like all the indigenous ones you say should exist uh, and we just happen to like free speech and civil liberties and cups of tea and fairness and that's what we are and you have to recognize us on your terms and it's quite and am i sort of close and what's even, not true about that well yeah and in your speech <laughs> i'll just i actually quote i got a quote from it when you did this speech in a pub and it's been titled, Why Aren't Free Speech Arguments Persuasive? I mean, you didn't really have a title probably because you were just in a pub, but it, it said, um, you said, the ability to speak freely and without punishment is actually the tradition of the indigenous tribes that occupy this land upon which you stand and upon whose traditions you're trampling. And someone actually laughed in the audience because it is kind of funny to hear that. It's kind of new. But then you sort of said, well, am I not right? And they were like, well, yeah. And it, you, you, so you've outflanked them with postmodernism, but it's postmodern traditionalism. Now, where have you, have you just come up with this yourself or is this some... Because I've never heard anyone else say it. Yeah, it's my, it's my innovation. Um, basically, I've had to study um, the modern left. And the modern left is, of course, deeply postmodernist. And po to, to, to summarize, essentially, what they're saying is there are no grand overarching stories that dictate all of human life. There are only local parochial stories which dictate certain people's lives and once you drill this all down it eventually comes to as you said the sort of radical subjectivity where all oh, each person's individual experience is different from the next and so their perception of the universe is different to the next and so there is nothing we can point to that is a, a concrete objective value system and in a way they are right right in a way that is actually correct and that's why they've been successful because they have hit on something here um but what they also have to concede is that, sure, I'm not making a claim. And the thing is, often it is made as a claim that this is the objective morality. And because this is what the Enlightenment essentially was all drilling down to try and achieve. And OK, I agree with the postmoderns that that doesn't exist. However, there are other things that do exist that are outside of myself, that, such as these traditions, that are things that I believe have moral value. And if you are saying, well, look, there is no objective moral value, then actually what you've done is empowered me and anyone who agrees with me to rightfully say, well, then my 
traditions, my moral system, is just as valid as any other, and therefore just as worthy of consideration as any other. So if you're going to tell me about the moral claims of the LGBT community or something like that, you can encounter hear the moral claims of the English community, because they have moral claims by your own standards. And I'm not saying that the English traditions, the English community, speaks for all of humanity. I'm not saying it's it's written in the stars. I'm not saying it's a, f a part of the fabric of the universe in an objective sense that everyone must be compelled to recognize. What I'm saying is, if you seek moral recognition from me, you must give me the same moral recognition in return. And now we can have a negotiation on the terms you laid out. And I think that's totally fair, and I don't see how anyone who is being genuine and reasonable could honestly refuse that yeah it's so it's a sort of admission like i say we've lost a certain battle it's obviously anti-imperial in the past it was like these are our values you might like them india and everyone basically said now nah, we're all right even if it could be said by many we improved certain things or the society was better they still went yeah. now nah, we don't like it and now we're going to get revenge on you for it because you imposed it upon us and you basically said fair enough i'm gonna we're gonna stop doing that but can you just leave us alone in england is really what you're saying in, yeah, kind I mean, of. that's in, in a way, that's what it amounts to. Um, but the, the thing is, there's, there's one thing... The, 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 the things driving the British Empire were contradictory. So on the one hand, you have um, the traditional British or English values, uh, which are intertwined with liberalism as an ideology, because liberalism as an ideology comes from England. And one of the reasons that it was the Americans who had the liberal revolution first in the American Revolution is because they were Englishmen. They were, you know, George Washington. Could you think of a more English name? Thomas Jefferson. You know, these are the most, like, quintessentially English-sounding names, right? And they thought of themselves as Englishmen. And the revolutionaries were arguing for their rights as Englishmen, which is where no taxation without representation came from. This is what, what the English Parliament represented. This is what it all comes from. And so the idea that you can sit there and go, well, liberalism is just distinct from the ether, and we plucked out these things arbitrarily, and we decided these are the rights of man. No, the rights of man are the French interpreting what the americans had done and being like yeah we want that too and it's like right you want to live as englishmen i get you you can't you're french right you've got many many other pathologies in you, the way you think but this is what they were trying to do and the drive to universalize everything comes from this but the thing is it's not universal it is particular to us and i mean don't get me wrong i'm not saying it's, it's unique to us there surely are other cultures <coughs> who can adopt these ways of being and make them work for themselves. But there are also co other cultures who can't and who aren't interested. Um, but the thing is, go back 150 years ago, and that wasn't well understood. And so it seemed that there could be a set of universal human rights that could be applied to everyone and that everyone would be accepting of, and they could be rationally deduced from first principles. It's just not the case, it turns out. And so every imposition that goes back to human rights, you've got to ask, well, on what do these human rights rest? And the answer just seems to be, well, we say so. Because mm. this is how we get to the positive human rights of Jeremy Corbyn, which is the example I always use. But we, we want broadband to be a human right. Healthcare can be a human right. It's like, right, okay, so we're not talking about natural rights anymore. Now we're talking about civic rights. So now it's literally about what the government is deigns to provide you. But the thing is, that was never where the rights of Englishmen came from. The rights of Englishmen were a very old cultural negotiation that involved many revolutions, many uh, uprisings, many uh, neg negotiations through force in the form of constitutional developments by the Saxon peasantry against the Norman nobility. This is what the rights of Englishmen were. And so they were, again, very situated in a place, in a time. And they had benefits for the English. That's what I'm interested in protecting. If other people want to say, yeah, we want a model like that, great, good for you. I totally endorse it. Best of luck. But you need to figure out an actual route and a set of foundations for this to rest on. Because at the moment, human rights don't rest on anything. And that's probably their biggest philosophical flaw, frankly. There are, there are others, but like this is definitely the major one. Um, and so, yeah, th this, this essentially is why I've just come to the conclusion that actually the imperious project of liberalism is not really for me. Because what it does is it says, no, 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 everyone's got these universal human rights. Well, why? Because we've decided they do. 
even though they don't really come from anywhere, and we're going to impose them on everyone else. It's like, right, so we've set ourselves the mandate to conquer the entire world and homogenize every culture in it. I actually don't want that. It's actually not really on my bucket list, you know? Right, and you, you've even said that civil rights are just whatever the state wants them to be. Well, once that's untethered. what a civil right is. Yeah, once, un- uh, yeah, well, once untethered from its religious foundation, that's all it means. Yeah, hmm. and so a few things on that. So, yeah... It, well, you, you've set out your argument. My question is, will it work? Because in your own speech, one bit that struck me, you, you pointed out that you, you said, we, we want free speech is the opening of redress from the weak against the strong. But it turns out the strong have to feel morally obligated to the weak. So the oppressors have to feel much like, let's just use the example of slavery. They, they felt, OK, it's the, morally we feel an obligation to get rid of this. They have to feel that themselves. And the, the elites seem to have got a sort of software upgrade at one point. They were already sort of liberals, but they've got a, an upgrade that said, OK, now we're doing wokeness. And, and they're already the same people in place, but they decided that now we hate free speech. Now we're kind of everywhere people. We hate the nation. I had even a friend who was a Remainer, not friends anymore, who said, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be more at home in Dusseldorf than Staines, which I thought was a bizarre Oh, very Keir statement. Starmerish. I'd yeah, rather yeah. be in and Davos than And he was Jewish, which is even more weird. I was like, it depends what, what era. <laughs> I mean, like, in Dusseldorf, I'm not sure. And, um, <laughs> yeah, 100 years ago in Dusseldorf. Yeah, yeah, not, not sure, sure about yeah. that, mate. You know, total, yeah. these weird displaced people were citizens of Europe and all this bollocks. But, but on this thing, so they're, they're, that's the elite now. The elite now doesn't believe in free speech. It doesn't believe in the nation. And it's, it's actually uh, antagonistic towards that. Mm. So why... Would they listen? Why would they listen to us? Basically, and you've sort of said, well, we have to try and appeal on to their instinct as a sort of where this oppressed tribe. But is that going to work? I mean, why would they listen? Well, the the thing is, so when we say the elite, we always have a habit of kind of homogenizing them, right? Because it sounds like it's a unified homogenistic class, but it's actually not. And there are always people who are competing for. Um, no, I don't want to say supremacy because that's the wrong term. But they're, they're competing for prestige, for power, for influence, for primacy, should we say, uh, in, in these groups. And they're people too. And they are subjected to moral arguments on a daily basis. And the left's moral arguments are being made from within the framework of liberal human rights. And so they're very powerful. Um, and the problem that we have as, say, conservatives or traditionalists is that we have been totally unable to articulate our own defense of ourselves from within the same framework or appeal to any kind of moral sentiments that might lay outside of that framework in a way that adequately breaks through the kind of armor of resistance that they end up putting upon themselves when they say, oh, that's racist or that's xenophobic or that's whatever it's like okay whatever you know we we are, we are failing to properly get through that now i'm not saying i've got all the answers at least not yet um, but that's what the project of lotuses.com is for it's to hopefully be able to at least articulate the problem in such a way that the people we are trying to appeal to at least recognize that we exist because at the moment they act as if we don't uh, and you see all the sort of neoliberal talking heads from uh, West the the Westminster bubble being like, oh yeah, look at them. Oh, they're saying Southeast England's full, but look at all this green land. <laughs> it's like, right, that's a brilliant statement. I w- I will I will take issue with that. You know, uh, the these people have to understand that it's not just empty land, just because there's not housing development on it. Yeah. Do you not... mean our country? The, the, the yeah, whole, yeah, whole yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. The, this the house country... looks empty. Yeah, this, this is the living room. There's some space over here. What are you- <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm not sat over there at the moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this this preposterous notion. Um, we 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 do have to find a way of making them understand the damage that they're doing, um, and conceiving ourselves in their own terms. At least at first, saying the English community lives in England, not a terribly controversial statement from their position, uh, is at least one way of making sure that we have a piece on the board when these these moves are being made. Like I said, I'm not saying I've got all the answers or anything like that. I'm not saying it's going to work either. Um, and if anyone's got any better ideas, feel free to tweet at me or something, um, because I'm always open to new ideas. But uh, I don't see any other way that we can maneuver from the position that we're in at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, no one else's ideas are working. Certainly the idea of just saying, hey, liberalism was better, let's go back to free speech, is not working at all, is it? We no. just keep saying it, but no one cares. So well, at least it's the tribal god of the English. 
Like the, yeah. like we believe in this, you know, it's it's one of our tribal gods, but it's not one of the tribal gods of the woke leftists. In fact, that's one of the demons for the woke leftists. And they're like, God, no free speech. We've got to get rid of that. Uh, yeah. And so. And I resented you? your blasphemous use of gods, but yeah, you, which we can get into later, but because you're not, you're an atheist, but you were right. You, you talked about things like meritocracy, fairness, thrift, decency, industry, even punctuality and politeness as being subjective gods that so to speak that values we, that values like. yeah that we happen Tri- to like tribal gods is just a a, 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 a pithy way of saying that these are system these are all part of a system of values that are in that are genuinely intrinsically um important to us on an not just like a, a rational level of course we can give any kind of rational explanation for these that we want but emotionally these matter to us and when these are start when these are trampled upon when these are taken away it causes us a kind of pain you know this yeah. kind of suffering in this when these things are desecrated and yeah. it's it speaks to a total lack of respect for the english in england that these aren't given any kind of consideration well one thing i've definitely noticed is how lost everyone feels and i even wrote this piece on my subject england is lost forever so not yeah. very subtle how i feel and obviously you feel similar though you're a bit more optimistic in some ways you're trying to do more about it perhaps other people i've spoken to Normal people of all kinds of political persuasions, men and women, are incredibly bleak about this. I was speaking to a guy who's a Christian the other day, who's seems like a, he's, he's not really like a very political guy. Then I spoke to a libertarian, but, but just normal people I know at work, and it's just like they're all feeling this. Not everyone. Mm. Toby Young's a bit more optimistic about it. Um, I was speaking to someone else, my mate, the other day, who's just more of a general optimist. But so many people just feel like our country's lost to one mm. degree or another. So, yeah, I mean, we're all feeling that. Well, not we're all, but loads and it's a huge no, number of people I, are feeling that. I, I, I see it as well. I think a lot of people are feeling it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I am an optimist about it, but I recently had a conversation with Pete Hitchens about it, and he's not very optimistic about this. So Yeah, yeah you <laughs> but, were more uh, optimistic than that. I mean, I, I said, like, he was, he's just like, this was how optimistic it was. He's like, England is, or Britain is lost forever ages ago. You're like, yes, it's lost forever but we should try and rebuild it. I mean, that's as optimistic as the conversation got. That was like yeah. abs- absurd, like blind optimism. But I but I noticed that by the end of it, I'd kind of won him round to, okay, well, look, what could we do? And he's like, look, you, you don't need to replant the seed. What you need to do is make sure that the, the tradition is continued, even if it's in a small way, just so one day it might be able to regrow. You know, it's it, it, likening the 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 culture of england to a garden or you know a a tree that has grown naturally over the centuries is completely correct and that's exactly what it is um and so he was like look you need you need to essentially save a sprig of this uh to make sure that the whole thing doesn't die and so that i think for now in this sort of dark era for our country is really our job you know and so one of the things i've done in recent years is spend a lot of time with english mythology because we mm. actually have quite a lot, and it's actually really great. And you don't you don't realize how awesome, uh, like the King Arthur mythos is, until you actually read the original medieval tales, and you realize, oh my god, this is absolutely epic! Like it's absolutely epic. Like you know, King Arthur's just like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go conquer Rome, the Roman Empire, because they demanded tax from me, and screw those guys. It's literally a model of Brexit. Like the King Arthur mythos is Brexit ri- in in story, and it's just amazing. And obviously Arthur wins, so, you know, that's obviously great. And so, you know, the, there's a kind of mythological narrative necessity in Brexit, right? That we, actually, no, we, we do kind of need to defeat the Continentals once again. Um, which one and, should we read? Because I remember reading Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but which what should we be reading if we had to just read one and we were lazy? Right, the, there's um, The Death of Arthur. Uh, there are two versions, and I believe the version I'm thinking of is the alliterative version, although it's been a few years, so... No, I'm, I'm sure it's the alliterative death of Arthur. Um, and so, yeah, Arthur, basically uh, a, a Roman senator, just comes to his court in Camulo Dunham or wherever it was, and uh, demands that he pay fealty to the, the emperor. And he's like, no, get, get stuff. <laughs> I, don't, I don't pay money to a, a continental. And they're like, well, then it's war. And so he's like, brilliant. And they raise a massive army and just conquers Rome. And the, 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 but the moral is that he's away too long and this allows Mordred to re- usurp his throne, steal Guinevere. And he comes back, has to try and defeat Mordred, who incidentally has an army of foreign warriors. You know, it's interesting <laughs> that he's brought in a lot of diversity. And Arthur does defeat him, but is mortally wounded in the process. And then he's taken off to the Isle of Avalon, 
where he is currently in convalescence, we are told, and in our hour of greatest need, will return. So we so can be diversity, vaccine. inclusion, and equity, but it might kill us. It might mortally wound us. That is the message, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the point and, is, it's it's an yeah. epic story. And like yeah. when you're going through it, you, like the first thing Arthur does when he arrives in France is have to fight a giant in personal combat because the giant's like busy tyrannizing some village or something. And he's just like, oh, well, I've got to go fight this giant. And so Arthur has to personally go kill a giant. It's like, that's a cool story. You know, what you want like day one, is it? You've just arrived. You're like trying to sort yeah. out your exchange of money and yeah. figure yeah. out where the bibliotech is. And you're like, oh, I'm fighting <laughs> Andre the giant. Um, yeah. All right, I have to read that. I, cause I, it's really good, honestly. Yeah, because you know loads about that stuff, and that's that's one thing I, I can't think of anyone else either who's really studied that stuff and tried to make it sort of popular. Um, I was going to actually, since you mentioned Hitchens, I was going to ask you later, but since you mentioned Hitchens, it was so funny that you had that um, argument with him on Twitter because we've just been talking about him a few days earlier. Well, we're not we what would you call it? Exchange. Hmm? It was a, it was a polite conversation. A polite as conversation, as well. definitely on your part. You were being extremely polite, and. Um, We've just spoken about him in the office of Lotus Eaters a few days earlier because we're both big Hitchens fans and we both listened to the mm. audio book of The Abolition of Britain. And I was yeah. saying it's kind of hilarious because he talks about the decadence and decay and I zoned out for a minute and thought, oh, he's talking about the internet. He was talking about television. And then you one up to me. You said, no, no, what about his bit on central heating? That's and so I, was, I was saying, like, I was doing a Hitchens riff, like, with, with the introduction of the chair into the British home, the, the decadence said it. You know, I mean, like the people, the, the people it proved impossible to resist the, the siren call of this four-legged creature, and people's spines ossified as soon as their willpower. It's that kind of thing. Is it's like <laughs> central heating, but he's right, it's isn't great. he? He's right. He he does have an argument for it actually, which is uh, for anyone who hasn't read the abolition of Britain, shame on you. But the the argument being. Well, if you, if you only have one room in the house heated, then the family is forced to gather in that room and spend time with one another ah. and actually form tighter bonds because they're constantly in one another's presence. And so you've got the, the sort of Petersonian constant negotiation with the other person to make sure everyone's happy and settled and comfortable. And so he does actually have a point. Like, if your entire house is heated in the winter, you don't have to spend all the time in the front room. If you have an argument with someone, you can just storm out and sit in another room perfectly comfortably. And you're not doing that necessary work to improve your relationship with that person. That's interesting. So he, he does actually have quite a good point underlying <laughs> I forgot it. that. I listened to the book. I thought it was just about the decadence of heat. I've accidentally left the heating on now and I've spent this whole podcast thinking, I'm too hot, I'm, I'm sluggish. I'm it's being like decadent. The decadence I'm of heat. I'm causing the fall of Britain. I yeah. grew up in the north. We didn't have it. My dad just said, run around, put on a jumper. I'm like, dad, there's <laughs> oh, an yeah. icicle on my face. Yeah, but it costs him money to run the heating and you've got extra jumpers. That yeah, was my dad. Right. Yeah, absolutely just, right. You know, get a jumper on. What did you think of his comment that you should apologize to Jess Phillips? Did you think that... Because you said you'll give it consideration. Hmm. Oh, I am considering it. Okay. Because um, it seemed to be like he was sort of... he. Was, my guess was he was saying it would be good for you more than her. Because, of yes. course, we know you can't apologize to bad faith actors. But in well, his the, Christian conception of the world, presumably he's saying it would be good for you. Yes. Uh, he is not wrong to say that, really, a good Englishman shouldn't use language like that. And Can I just is, explain quickly for the listener? If in case they've lived in a cave, Carl said a rude joke about Jess Phillips years ago and yeah. got in a bit of a pickle. Is that fair enough? That's fair, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was a rude joke. And I, sh- I shouldn't have done it, really. Um, but, of course, I don't really think these people are serious people. And I don't think they care. Um, the, if, if I had caused genuine offence to someone, I would apologise to them. I wouldn't need to do it publicly unless, of course, they were asking for that. I would do it privately. And Hitchens said, maybe you should do it both, actually. And uh, and if I thought I was dealing with a good faith actor who was genuinely offended and not a feminist radical who was just using this as a political stick, then I would. Um, but the thing that Hitchens is appealing to here is a sentimental relationship that he presumes exists between fellow countrymen, right? As in... He is saying, look, you don't, you don't have to know each other personally, but because you are both living in the same country, you are both part of the same group in a way, uh, you should have consideration for one another in this way. And it's like, sure, and I actually do agree with him on this, but she did break this consideration first. She's the one, in my opinion, who has severed these bonds. And so it is incumbent on me in a way to try and restore these bonds but frankly i've just 
not really going to do with Jess Phillips. I don't mm. like I said, I I don't think she's good faith enough. Um but his advice is not bad advice, but it presumes something that doesn't really exist. And maybe like in his youth there would have been this kind of this kind of thick social connection that people across the country would have felt. But I think that twenty five years of Blairism has really destroyed this. Well you know, so I thought you could have said to him, as someone who was a radical Trotskyist in his youth Mr. Hitchens, you could have said to him, well, Mr. Hitchens, you know full well you can't reason with these people because you were one of them. And he even burnt a Bible at, and he would perhaps say that it was, you know, it was for your own salvation. And he might also say he has publicly recanted on that many, many times over the years, whereas you, I suppose, haven't publicly recanted on that. And perhaps that would be the, the nuance there. You know, it's, it's not just that. Like what Hitchens is saying, look, the, the way... Th- to rebuild the country would require the reforging of these social bonds. And in a way, I had a actually deliberately broken one. Because what Jess Phillips is constantly playing on is the idea that we owe her something. Socially, that we owe her some kind of moral consideration. And really, the, the cutting edge of my joke is that, no, I don't owe you a damn thing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you're an alien who's just turned up, spouting all this feminist BS about how men are the perennial evil. That's just not the way this country has ever worked. And you know that's not how this country has ever worked. And it's because you're a radical leftist who essentially is like an alien who lands in any civilization. And that you should see, I mean, just think of the way that when the left takes over a country, they act like conquering warlords, as if Genghis Khan has just rocked up in France. And they started genociding parts of france because they're more royalists and things like this and the, the left do this everywhere they do this in soviet union they do it everywhere and so it's cuba you know you can just name a place china name a place where the left has taken over and they start genociding portions of the population and so what they're saying there is that look we as the leftists the ideologically possessed leftists have no connection to these people and it's not just that we have no connection to them we are as, as far as they're concerned evil and so eradicating them is good and that's what Jess Phillips is buying into. And I'm sure she'd be like, well, I don't want to eradicate anyone. It's like, well, maybe you do. Maybe you do. How do you feel about Andrew Tate? You know? She did How have a popper. Um, Owen you Jones know? recently said he was too far and she was trying to be more pragmatic. And she sort of owned Owen Jones. But yeah. Yeah, I saw that too. But again, it's easy to own Owen Jones because he's got a ridiculous position. But to say, to, to she she would repudiate that she has any moral obligation to arch misogynists up and down this country, even though, in a way, I think she does, and this is really how I feel she's broken these bonds. Because at the end of the day, no matter what you think, they're your countrymen. You know, you don't just get to say, these are the evil people that I'm going to stigmatise for my own political advancement. You don't get to do that. And once you've done that, okay, well, now you've broken the bond. Um, and so Hitchens, uh, probably not privy to this sort of information about the subject, is just looking at me and thinking, well, he broke the bond. It's like, no, I did, you know, my part, but she had broken it first. And that's well, he was where saying I that see that. You use tools and weapons that he wouldn't allow himself. And in doing so, you kind of win a Pyrrhic victory because you've had to stoop to that level to win. This was part of his argument. And I wonder mm. how you feel about that. This might be a bit of a mainstream media question because you were treated no, no. terribly... There was a Victoria Derbyshire interview where she, you, you did very well, but they kept trying to smear you. And, of course, because of their lies, as you said, you were attacked in the street. All this disgusting stuff. You made an off-colour joke in a context of a long career of, of you know YouTube banter. And they obviously decided to take it out of context and destroy you. And it was all pretty disgusting. That said... I didn't feel very destroyed, though. No, they didn't succeed. Anyway. They tried to. You know, they're attacking you on the street. You're a very robust person, like far more than me. But, you know, you take all the slings and arrows of the culture war. But when people are attacking you on the street because of mainstream media lies, I think anyone would say that's, that's unfair. But hmm. my point is, I just put that in as a caveat to say they treat you very badly. But is there something in Hitchens' point that you might be yourself taken more seriously? Because you're a sort of deep thinker, nice guy, despite what some people think. And it's like, you've got this reputation. I, I don't ever recall offending Claire Fox. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Claire. <laughs> because I, oh, this is a reference to, I was at um, some debate thing and a young lad came up to me and said, what's Sargon like? And I said, yeah, nice guy. And I just heard a voice say, he's not a nice guy. And I turned around, it was Claire Fox. And I really like Claire Fox. She's great. But for some reason, maybe because of the Jess Phillips thing, she thinks you're not a nice guy. I, 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 like I said, I don't ever recall doing anything against Claire Fox, you know, no, no. no ill will. No, um, she, it's probably just because of that thing she's heard, maybe. I, who knows? We'll, we'll ask yeah. her. But, but does it make you more, less, because you're already up against it, because let's face it, 
Now, you're an ordinary person from Swindon or somewhere. You've had a normal job. You're much like me, except you've done the reading. But we're from the comprehensive schools, I'm guessing. Are you, or are I you... went to the schools on military camps because okay. my dad was in the RAF. Okay, so uh, you they, might... were, they were not of high quality. If that's right, right, right. So we're not, you know, we're in the sort of lower middle class at, at best, right? Yeah. And and whereas you, Douglas Murray, is very impressive person, very important books, but with his posh accent and his posh education, you know, he's taken more seriously. So do you think is the question I'm trying to get to that that kind of thing has stopped you being taken seriously in a, a regrettable way in, in any way? Yeah, there's definitely an element of classism to it, but I'm not too worried about that because it's not it's not important or imperative to me to join their club. Um, what's important and imperative to me is that the regular person watching what I say resonates with them, and so they go, "Yeah, no, that is how I feel." Actually, I am. I do feel like I am an Englishman trapped in an occupied country at the moment uh, because we are. And I, you know, once it once the sort of the consciousness of this goes beyond me, then that's fine. That's all I need, you know, for us to actually think of ourselves as a, a people who occupy a place. Like, because mm. the entire world thinks of the English like this. Like, they all think of us like this. Yeah. Uh, and they all have an impression of us in their heads. And they are shocked to arrive in London. I get so many Americans, so many Canadians and Australians being like, where are the English in London, man? I came to visit England. I didn't see any English people. So I asked because you went to London, mate, where there aren't any, basically. Do you know what's you mad know about the... that? Uh, Andrew Sullivan, yeah, who's a, a conservative in name, but he's basically a liberal. He's an extremely moderate conservative. He wrote a piece. Yeah. Even he conceded in the piece. I think I've written it down. That, that um, He said it was an accidental revolution we'd had with mass immigration, but he said an accidental revolution is still a re revolution. And I would ask those to, who rightly denigrate the term great replacement to provide an alternative phrase to describe a city which was 87% white British a half century ago and 36% today. It's the kind of demographic change only previously seen in other parts of the world in times of plague invasion and campaigns of ethnic cleansing. And that's Sullivan saying that. But the bit that it reminded me of particularly was he said uh, some, he saw some friends and they said, I cannot tell you how happy it makes me that I can go around London and never hear English spoken. And he goes, and I can sometimes see a point. I'm like, that's mental. Like, Imagine going to Lisbon, you're like, oh, there's no Portuguese being spoken. That's so nice. I mean, you don't have to be a xenophobe or a racist. Thing. That's weird. In the capital city of England, you're, you're celebrating no English being heard. I mean, it's just weird, isn't it? Well, I mean, it seems kind of genocidal, doesn't it? <laughs> well, even, like, even Sullivan's dicey with it. He's sort of, he's sort of going, yeah. guys, this is a bit ethnic cleansy, but he can't quite <laughs> yeah, say yeah. it. <laughs> like, like, you know, if, if this was an Arab saying, yeah, well, you know, I went, I went to whatever city and I didn't hear any Kurdish, it was brilliant. You'd be like, but that was a Kurdish city. What happened? Yeah. You could at least imagine mm -hmm. feeling neutral about it or you just don't really think to talk about it. But to actually say you, it made you happy, it's kind of sick, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah, that's It's, it's actually, it, it's to suggest that the English have got no right to live in London. Basically. It's bizarre. And, and, and yeah. very normal lib North London people who I know all feel like that as well. And they're like, you know, it's very important my kid that's English spoken in the, in the school when he grows up. Mm. The most lib, normal, normy people would think this. This is not a radical Why position. No, no, it's Why right. shouldn't they? It's their civilization. It's bonkers. It's bonkers. <laughs> and I thought, I'd, yeah. can I just do, because I've done the other two parts of the, the Trinity. You came back on Twitter. And this is a whole structure of my podcast just comes together now. You came back and you said, Englishman, postmodern traditionalist. And then the other thing you added is sensible centrism. So I thought we'd mm. do a bit on sensible centrism just quickly where... I'd love to. You did, you've uh, got your pinned tweet. Let, can I just read it out for the listeners? You, got, you can, yeah, yeah. You've got a pinned tweet and it says, <laughs> sensible centrism is... Reducing legal and illegal immigration to zero, abolishing yeah. hate speech laws, maintaining national sovereignty, purging wokeness from institutions, restoring the death penalty for severe crimes, promoting family values, reducing the welfare state. And I think some yes. of those are completely like obvious. Um, family values, welfare state, fair enough. Purging wokeness, of yeah. abolishing hate speech laws. Most people agree. I think there's three more controversial ones. Reducing uh, uh, illegal and illegal. Now, most people say, yeah, this illegal immigration, the boats has gone a bit mad. But legal immigration to zero, sensible centrism. I mean, I agree, but like, you know, because no, 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 it's gone so most, far since 1997. But most people in this country support every single one of those points. I wrote an article about this for lotuseats.com called The Sensible Center, in which I just go through the data. We have the polling data. For, on, the, on the subject of immigration, the British public has never had a referendum on this there is never this has never been a 
platform that any of the political parties have ever run on and it was the labor party themselves in the early 2000s who said yeah we're going to we're going to rub the right's nose in diversity by opening the borders this was done maliciously and whenever anyone is asked about immigration in any way shape or form overwhelmingly the answer is always i do not want immigration this has always been the majoritarian position of the british public and so what sensible centrism is is a non-ideological way of expressing political demands. Because an ideology is something that is a priori constructed. It is constructed in the abstract from who knows where. It could be anywhere. It could be any time, any place. And it could apply to anywhere. And they it would the the point of an ideology is to reformat the country along this prescribed lines. And but sensible centrism is actually the opposite. It is to extract from the contingent, from what already exists, what it is the majority perspective wants. And that's the democratic way of doing things. It isn't for minorities come along and impose their will on the majority through clever argumentation. What it is is say, what do the majority actually want out of democratic politics? And the first thing is that the majority have never wanted by a massive margin immigration ever. And why would you? Why would you want an you know, infinity number of foreigners to come and occupy your cities. Why would you want that? Well, no one would want that. Low birth rates is the only possible thing I could think of that we're not replacing ourselves. <clears throat> but even then, that opens you up to two problems. One, why should other people replace us if we're not replacing ourselves? And secondly, what do you think stops those people from falling into the same bad habits we've fallen into when it comes to families and births right yeah. like, like we don't want we to replace know. ourselves guys why stop coming in we want to end this <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but, but we I know, see what you mean though but we know that when foreigners come to live here their children have the same birth rates as right. us yeah yeah like everyone's like oh god the muslims are gonna outbreed us actually no if you look in two generations the muslims are down to 2.2 children from like four children and it's like and it's just going down it's like right so in fact what we are in At the least west is <laughs> yeah, there is that. So the death we, we, wish of the culture. But we're kind of like a black hole for your lineage, right? Mm. If you don't if if you want your family line to end, move to Britain, move to America, move to Canada because that's going to happen. You know, yeah. if you don't want your family line to end, don't move here because then you might actually have grandchildren. Yeah. I'm not Japan even are really in trouble as well, but loads of countries are in trouble. I mean, Japan, Japan Italy, um, the two that are just there is a chasm of demographic problems. That they're looming into. Is it just economic, um, a certain economic development, or is it just another whole? No, you don't. You don't want to know what it is. Okay, well, let's not even go into. I just wanted to know because we haven't got time. But the, what's interesting is that Dominic Cummings, for example, he says the same as you, but he draws an opposite conclusion. Maybe it's just terminology. He says the average English or British person has a weird mixture of views. They want low immigration, but they love the NHS, and they want the death penalty, which we can get onto. But he yeah, says but these therefore incompatible. Well, he says, therefore, the center is a fiction. He says this idea of the center yeah. ground is a fiction. Well, you've just said the same sort of thing, but the opposite, that's sensible centrism. Well, immigration is destroying the NHS. It's actively destroying it. And we can see it. And it's inevitable because if you have a service that is free to use at the point of use, uh, then, and you allow in a million people a year, which the Conservatives did last year, then a percentage of those are going to use the system without having had the opportunity to pay into it. So they are going to be a net drain on that system. And then if, let's say, 100% of them get a job and start paying taxes, which they won't, but it doesn't matter, the next year you're still going to have a million more people come in taking a percentage out. And so you've got this cumulative downward trend of the efficacy of the system. It is inevitable that demand will outstrip supply. And that's why the the budget for the NHS graph keeps going like this. And the Labour will be like, oh, there have been Tory NHS cuts. No, they haven't. There's never been a cut to the NHS. It's just more, 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 more every single year. And it can never be any other way because of just the scope of the service that we're offering is essentially free healthcare to the entire world. Right. For example, visitors to this country should pay for the NHS. Right. That's just like a person could come here on holiday and claim on the NHS. They can do this. They can just, you know, go in, say, look, I've got a broken arm. Fix it. That's however much that costs. And then we've paid for it. You've paid for it. And then they can just piss off back to Greece or Rome or wherever it is they've come from. Not that these places probably do, you know, be somewhere else. But like having this and it's the same with the welfare state. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of libertarians say you can have the welfare state if you have a strong border. Exactly. Exactly. If you have a, a contained system that is not simply open to the entire world, just come in and use, then it is an affordable thing. And I actually like the NHS as a concept because it has this kind of 
social substratum to it, right? It is it is nice that it is something that we all have as Brits, but I don't want to share that with people who aren't Brits, and I don't see why I should have to because that's my money. Mm. You know, they're not a part of this country. They haven't paid into it. They they haven't contributed to the structures and the institutions that maintain this country. They're actually just coming in and taking from us. Why yeah. are we allowing that? Well, the irony we about it at the that. moment is it actually is being destroyed by people who won't admit that it needs reform. And now Labour have started to admit it needs reform, whereas Tories are saying, no, it doesn't. But that'll lead Finally. to a two-tier system. Yeah, yeah. And Finally, the Labour Party is doing what the Conservatives refuse to do. <laughs> it's insufferable. I know, and because Conservatives, it's more controversial if they do it because they're evil Tories. But I suppose you've sort of touched on national sovereignty there. So that kind of covers that. The one that I really want to cover is restoring the death penalty for severe crimes. I mean, actually, like you say, most people think this. And I was there was a, a story yep. that poor kid, Arthur... Hughes, and there's so many stories like this where let's just take this example a couple have tortured a child to death essentially and they filmed it that you know that was one that was one case I, there's many cases like this and you go right, i'm not familiar know, with that one i think but yeah well that, i mean one, let's just take this as an example though, well that was one that struck me and i looked it up and in looking it up i tried to i found another one that was that was a teenager that was very similar but this kid did this Arthur Hughes, they'd, they'd, they'll malnourish him, they'd, they'd poison them with salt. Oh, I do know, I do it's know the so kids horrific. I think I am aware of this. Yeah, the reason I mention it is just a clear-cut example of we have the evidence, there's even CCTV that they've even filmed themselves because yeah. they're sickos. Death is too good for these people, but we, at the very least, should have the death penalty for these people. And actually, like you say, most English or British people think that. Yes. The, again, polling on this is actually really consistent. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the death penalty was abolished in 1965 by a Romanian immigrant. Thanks for that. Traditionally British Romanian immigrant uh, who joined the Labour Party, got into Harold Wilson's government. Uh, sorry, no, he was a, an MP. Sorry, not he wasn't in the government. He wasn't in the government because he was too left wing, incidentally, for the Labour Party. He was a known communist. And so he wasn't invited to be a part of the government. Um, his name was Sidney Silverman, and he was just a lifelong, ooh, the death penalty's terrible. And it's he is the reason that Ian Brady and Myra Hindley weren't executed for torturing and sexually assaulting children. Five children, I think it was. Uh, he's the reason that they died of natural causes, incidentally. Uh, which, again, I completely agree with you and all right-thinking people that, no, that's way too good for them, and they should have been hanged from the neck until dead. Uh, because that is the traditional English moral recompense that monsters get for doing monstrous things. But moreover, it's an example to other people. It's to say, no, 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 no. You torture and murder a child, that's you. That's you, and that is you, and we will be proud that that will be you. You do not get to do that and live. You do not get to do that and have a second chance to do it. You know, this... And why should we, like, I hate the whole life order thing. Oh, they'll spend their entire lives in jail. Well, then just kill them. I don't want to pay for that. Why should I have to pay for the upkeep of this child murderer? No, no, no. Hang them so I can point at my son and go, that's what murderers get, son. You know, that's what I want. And that has always been the traditional English way. And that was abolished by an immigrant, obviously, and the Labour Party, obviously, right? And if you ask people, if you poll them, and even places like YouGov get this result. Now, YouGov being uh, an online self-selecting polling mechanism. So it shifts entirely left wing because, of course, young people and the left are very online, whereas a lot of people who are older and conservative are not online. Even YouGov finds that a majority, if you just ask the question, do you think the death penalty should be re restored for severe crimes? That 51% are like, yeah, <laughs> not even any question. Yeah, of course. No question of it. But then if you actually frame the question with regard to a specific crime, for mm. example, terrorism or the murder of children, that shoots up to around 60%. Like, and 60% of online respondents are like, yeah, yeah, of course we should kill those people. Of course we should. Because they're evil and they don't deserve to exist. They have proven to themselves, uh, to us, that these are actual evil people. And we have punishments for this. They should, <laughs> and we did, they should go through the court. If it is found that they committed the crime, they should be justly punished. This is the appropriate recompense. And the argument will always be, oh, but, 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 but innocent people. It's like, well, I don't think we should hang innocent people, obviously. And uh, the methods we have for detecting whether someone committed a crime now are way better than they had in the 60s and before. And in fact, like you said with this case here, we actually have... And a, a level of proof that allows us to rule out the possibility that it was not the person we have convicted. 
because we're not relying on a preponderance of evidence standard. We're not saying, well, you're most likely to have done this. You can prove without any room for doubt, without error, that this person committed this crime. And so the only argument that the the liberal will come back with, really, can be, yeah, but I just believe in the sanctity of human life. You'd be like, why? You're not a Christian. You know? No, you don't. Do you really feel that about Islamic terrorists? No, you don't. You're not complaining about drone strikes in the Middle East. You don't really believe that. You're just afraid that for some reason it might be you. Well, to be honest with you, if you ever rape and murder a child, I think it should be you. And if I happen to ever do that, I think it should be me too, okay? Like, that's the right punishment. And the majority of people agree with it. Yeah, that's the sensible centrist position. And um, the yeah, the only argument, well, the, the argument I've mainly heard is the state gets things wrong. Do you really trust the state? No, but as you said, sometimes we can, now we can get it absolutely nailed on. And two, yeah. I add that in a hypothetical just state that would do all these things, it would be a better state than the one we have now. So you could trust well, it a bit more. This is the, this is this is the a point that Pete Hitchens made in a in a recent, I think it was Oxford address he made. He was like, look, you already do trust the state to do these things. That's why they have a military, you know. We have a military. They they do kill people. You know, they there are all sorts of you know we have armed police forces and things like that. We do trust the state to do these things, and it's not right. the state. It is the legal system. Do we trust a judge and a jury to adjudicate fairly? And actually, yeah, we do. You know, we that's why we have them. That's yeah. why, every, you know, that's, that's why we have point. a you venerable... You're not consistent inst- in the standard. You will allow the so-called state to kill. You just, this makes you squeamish, but you allow it in other circumstances. Exactly. But also, we're not asking politicians to be the arbiters of this. You know, we're not electing representatives. We have a, a venerable judicial institution in this country that is actually professionally geared around delivering justice. Like, actually, I do think we can trust their judgment if... For example, this couple who filmed themselves torturing and murdering a child, it can be proven beyond doubt that it was them. Yeah. No one else could have been. There's no question of it. Then, yes, justice should be served. And, okay, fine. If you want to quibble and be like, well, look, maybe hanging's too much, maybe a lethal injection. All right, liberal, fine, fine. <laughs> you know, if we can't publicly hang them and, you know, go down and have a nice day out about it, fine. Lethal injection it will be. That's your concession to liberalism. You're a reasonable person. I am a reasonable You're person. a nice guy. Um, I think so. Do you know what? I just wanted to quickly, since you mentioned it, Hitchens makes some sort of Christian argument for the death penalty, which I can't remember, which I wish I could, because the people say, how can you be a Christian and support the death penalty? But you're not a Christian, and I've tried unsuccessfully to try and get you to be one very badly, and it somehow ended up on Reddit. Uh, don't you oh, has that. it? Yeah. <laughs> how did that end um, up on Reddit? Yeah, yeah. It was like, fake it till you make it to heaven, Kyle. Uh, basically, my argument... I mean, I had this rationalist argument. I thought it was rational, but you, you didn't think so. But it, it wasn't enough to, to, be, to beat you. But it was, I was saying to you that, well, the way I came to it was, I was listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson, and he was sort of talking about, you know, the archetypes and blah, 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 and, you know, the Jungian substrate. And yeah, that's all very well, and it's great. He sort of introduced a kind of meta-Christianity, which young people have been able to adopt and so on. And he's introduced sort of Christian ethics without the belief part, which people have stigmatized about so they, they wouldn't embrace it's quite clever but that's also the flaw of what he's done because then it's quite weak yeah. broth isn't it without the actual belief part then it hit me one day what if we just decided to believe in it <laughs> which people think is, is, is sort of like pretending you do but i don't think it is pretending you do i think it is just i just maintain that's how it's always been now it's a bit of hitchin says something similar he says would you rather live in a world where your actions have meaning and so on or some random violent chaos that's not quite my point though it is a rationalist argument for it my point is more that actually haven't we always hasn't it always been our responsibility to uphold God rather than the other way around? If God just arrived and said, "Hey, I'm here. This is what you should do," there'd be no argument. It's always been up to us, in lieu of actual uh, concrete evidence, to to sort of to uphold God. And then the thing is, Carl, I can make subjective arguments. Like I actually had a dream where I saw God and Jesus, and it, but that sounds mental. Then I sound hey, mental. man. Look, I I am more than willing to accept that the it came to me in a dream argument from someone. <laughs> Uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a postmodern uh, traditionalist. Yeah, if, you're right. If it came to you in a dream, who am I to criticize? It did, and it right. was it was pretty profound. But it, I'll never be able to convey that. But I, I don't see what. So you said to me once, and I'm I'm not going to beat you in argument because you you do it for a living. But you said to me once, why do? Or, or you said to people, I can't remember. You know, how, why don't you have kids? Because you say it quite a lot. In fact, on Lotus, is people should have kids. It's their responsibility. Some politicians don't have any investment in the future. 
So you're quite sort of bullish on the idea of having kids because it's the right thing to do for society. And I thought, well, why can't you then just believe in God, Carl? Because it's a lot easier. There's a lot less money involved. You don't have to find a wife. And, it is, and, and you've admitted that it is better for society. And this would be better as a Christian country. And it is a Christian country. So therefore, why can't you just man up and do it? <laughs> Uh, honestly, it's about authenticity, authenticity and sincerity, right? Um, because I'm a product of the 80s and 90s, and I was raised without the need for religion. And so I, it's not a, a void in my life that I need to fill, frankly. Mm. Uh, I, never, I never feel a spiritual emptiness with regards to religion. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not a defect. I'm not saying that it's not something in which I'm deficient. I'm just saying it just isn't there for me. Right. Um, it might be that simple because... No, I was going to say, I was born in the 80s and grew up in the 90s, but we went to very religious schools because schools were then. It was only a Protestant right. school, C of E. And I, I, always, I always basically was vaguely Christian. Then for a while I sort of wasn't, but I was never, never called myself an atheist. Now you go a bit further, you actually do always call yourself an atheist. You don't say agnostic even. Yeah, I mean, it's just true. You know, I, I, I personally don't have any religious convictions. Um but I don't want to deny them in others, right? And like I've said before, my 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 son's always like, I believe in God, and he's like, good son, that's good, you know. And I totally support him in that. And we were in the other, we were in the car the other day. And he was like, Dad, are we Christians? And my daughter was like, No, we're not Christians. She's thirteen, he's seven. I was like, Yes, we're Christians. And he was like, See, I told you. And I'm like, Right, okay, you know. So I, I'm I'm more than willing to uphold it for him uh, and her and. My wife's a Christian, you know, she calls herself Christian, and she's totally religious as well, really. So that um, might have been you saying we're cultural Christians in a sense then? No, like, as a family, we're a Christian family. Now, you know, I, I'm personally not a religious person. But, um, but really, I think an Englishman is a Christian. That's the thing. Hmm. Like, you can't get away from that. Like, historically, traditionally, like, what an Englishman is, in one, it, the religious aspect of it is a Christian aspect. Um, it's also underpinned by like a kind of a legacy pagan morality that affects the Christian nature of the Englishman. But like that's a deep subject. I yeah, it sounds to sounds now. vaguely blasphemous to me. I'm not not well, sure about yeah, that. Well, yeah, it, it does. <laughs> but it, it it's it's about how. But the, the Christianity in England is not the same as Christianity on the continent, which is why England's always been a bit of an aberration, actually, when it comes to Christianity. Um, but the the point is, I I personally just don't. I would feel inauthentic and insincere if I would say yes, I'm a Christian. I found God. I'll oh, praise Jesus. I would feel inauthentic, and I don't I don't want to feel inauthentic. I'd rather tell people the truth, and then be like, look, I'm not hostile to Christianity. I don't want to undermine Christianity. In fact, I would like to bolster Christianity where I can see it needs help. Um, but I'm personally not a Christian, and it's not for any de lack of desire mm. um, for example like the christians have a very terrible habit of anthropomorphizing god they 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 make god into a person they expect to to see and it's like no this is how the atheist always beats you because they're like well where's god it's like well look uh, the, the the proper christian theology behind it would be like god is literally the entire universe he is intrinsic to every atom of the universe so anything you point to as an atheist is pointing at god so god becomes like a, a kind of logical necessity that extends above the purely material realm that the atheist wants to drive you down into and beat you on like a lack of evidence no there's no point asking for evidence of god that's such a stupid argument because it's a transcendental question you know, in and of itself, the, the terms are wrong and you can never win on them. But the atheist can never defeat you on your terms, which is why they don't want to have the argument on those terms. Right. You, and yeah. so I, I say this coming out of like the new atheist movement, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, well, I'm, I'm familiar with all the arguments and the atheists, uh, it's kind of dull when it comes to it. Like they don't really seem to get what the Christians have been saying, but that's probably because the Christians haven't been articulating themselves properly either. The, the Christians would be better to say, look... God is essentially the sort of sum total of all of the things in the universe and how they work. And so you know that if you eat too much food, you're going to get really fat. This is a natural force in the universe. And you can say, well, look, this is God's will to me to not eat so much food because the negative consequence was intrinsically inbuilt into the universe. That therefore becomes like a message from God. Hmm. Right? A Christian can make that argument. Actually, that kind of makes sense because then you can see that there is an intentionality behind the universe as a whole. 
for a human being what what c.s lewis would call the tau of the universe oh yeah like and you relative to what we are the the world itself is relative to us and we have a place in it and there's an intention that underlies it but like, I'm, i know i'm going off on one but like no, it's, no, it's, it's frustrating to see christians not argue these points well and, and atheists get it i mean yeah god is everything but he is also a bloke but <laughs> but when you talk he's about, also english you know? you, yeah, he's an english <laughs> folk much like us but when you when you talk about um the atheists as well they do get it wrong i mean sam harris said look we've been able to explore all of space now and he's not there it's like sam <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> exactly i mean watch, is it? watch william lane craig against christopher hitchens if you think that the atheists always win because he hitchens didn't win because he didn't have any of the arguments ready for the philosophical argument so, I, I haven't seen that one there's a couple of them recently <laughs> recently um, yeah, you know, it's been many a decade since I've watched anything like that. But um, but yeah, it, it is remarkable. I like I like Sam Harris, but like that, well, like we looked up into the sky and we couldn't see God. <laughs> no kidding, Sam. I know he's had some weird takes lately. <laughs> Thanks for that. Carl. I, I feel like since you just very briefly since you mentioned your family and stuff, I just want to ask you. Mate, it's not. It's only just tangentially related. But what should people do? I'm always asking you. You know, England is lost. We're all screwed, but a lot of people look up to you. You've got a lot of these young lads. What should we do now as, as people to sort of live? And you, you've mentioned Aristotle as <sighs> yeah. a sort of guide for you. He's helped you lose weight. Yeah, yeah. Um, pursue virtue is and re resist vice is, I think, honestly, the sum total of moral reasoning. Like, everything after Aristotle has been a waste of time, essentially. <laughs> like, oh, I, I want to argue the utilitarian ethics. No, shut up. You know, you don't. You're full of. You're full of shit. Just, just, you know, be a good person. Just go and be a decent person. Repeatedly do the right thing, as you judge the right thing to do. You know, you are. You are a good moral authority on this. You know, and if you have to try and rationalise over and over, repeatedly, why something's right, then it's probably not right, and you know that you're kind of lying to yourself. You know, well, the, the virtue is self-evident, right? It's it's just obvious what virtue is. Virtue is something that makes you good, strong, and wholesome. You don't need to rationalize it, actually. It's vice that you need to rationalize as being acceptable for various X, Y, and Z reasons. You know you should get up and go for a run. You know you should eat a salad or, you know, healthy food and not eat a McDonald's. You know McDonald's is vice, and you rationalize why you can have, oh, I've had a rough day, I've been, on, I've been good at my diet, I can accept this cheat day, and that's fine. That's fine. Everyone indulges in vices. Just make sure that the virtues outweigh the vices. Just try and be a good person. Try and do the right thing for yourself, for other people, for the people around you. And then that will be, you will be generally happier. You will be loved by the people around you. You won't be despised by them. You will have a better life than if you do the opposite, which is stay on your own and indulge in your vices and just get into this downward spiral where you're depressed all the time. You never get any sunlight. But that that is just basic things like this you can do it's within your power it's within everyone's power no one's got an excuse and just get out and do it and you will find your life is better for it That's and it. Is, is that how you're lastly how you're so productive because i know some really productive people toby young andrew doyle toby's always late for everything andrew always looks a bit stressed but you you're the most zen person while producing a huge amount you run a whole business is it just yeah. that you've employed loads of people i mean i always think how is carl doing it you seem super chilled but you're producing a huge amount of stuff all the time what is the secret to that and with my tim ferris hat on what's the answer to that i don't know um <laughs> is it just how you are because you're quite low in what peterson would call low in negative emotion like you, you we did it we did a personality test and you had very low neuroticism is, is that what it is yeah yeah I, like i i guess i guess i've got a superiority complex or something <laughs> i just you know I, I i you just go this is right i will do it and there's just no yeah, like questioning I, I, I just a lot of people are just idiots actually <laughs> I, i've i've i'm old and i've learned over a long period of time that actually you don't need to be very insecure about yourself if you're just kind of average, because it turns out that most people are just kind of average. And so if you've put a bit of work into a particular thing, most people, even if they don't understand it, their opinions don't really matter that much if you're sure that it's the right thing to do. Uh, and so as long as you've done the work, you can be confident in yourself because other people who haven't done the work, well, they don't know. Okay, But I'm impressed so, that you might always manage to do the work. I, I don't know, like some people just don't do as much as that it's you know well, you do all this reading huge amount of reading and stuff like that the the the, the thing it, it doesn't matter what it is the more you do it the better you get at it right and if you want to get a good end result then you just have to get on with it just just do move make it happen and it's okay to fail like all of life like no one succeeds on their first try at anything 
you know every time you see a victory that's on top of a string of defeats and that's okay it's okay to lose it's okay to fail what's not okay is to pick yourself back up look at how you failed and do better next time you have to do better next time and that's the continual iterative process until suddenly you start getting victories and you realize ah now i because the, the reason you failed is because you didn't understand what how whatever system you're dealing with works that's what it is because and as soon as you but you get the experience through directly going through it right that failed because of this that failed because of that so if i just avoid these right i got further the next time right that but it failed because of this and that right and the next and but then suddenly you get to where you're aiming for and you realize that you have now mastered the system you can move through it without triggering the fail states and you get to where you want to be and you can be proud of your work and you can explain to others what it is that you learned that they haven't yet learned so you know for them hopefully it won't be quite as difficult and this is what traditions are this is the iterative process of learning and passing on wisdom hmm. so just a bit of self-confidence i guess excellent and what could be more english than just getting on with it <laughs> i love that just Great. stiff up a lip yeah yeah head down that's a know? great ending so um Thanks for doing this, Carl. So, of course, you're um, Sargon underscore of underscore of ACAD on Twitter, lotuseaters.com. Anywhere else you think people should check out? No, I mean, if you use YouTube, just podcast of the Lotus Eaters, but we're that on every platform, really. So yeah, and you do a podcast every us. day, and then the, the last bit you have to subscribe for. Yes. Yeah, and I'm sometimes on there when I manage to get out to swim them, which I will do because I owe you one now. And of course, I'm yes, Nick. Yes, waiting for you, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do it again soon. And I'm Nick Dixon Comic, of course, even though I'm barely comic anymore. This is very, very serious, but I'm stuck with that name. And nickdixon.substack.com. And thanks for listening slash watching. All right. Cheers, Carl.